different language groups of the Eastern Kulin nations whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely, I want to pay my respect to the wider unceded lands of this nation where we're all meeting from today. So first off, for those who don't know, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, maths, and lastly, medicine, so STEM M. And while STEM plays an incredibly important role in our universities, women in higher education continue to study lower rates of STEM education than men. Of all higher education enrolments in Australia in 2018, just 9% of women were studying STEM and that's compared to 35% of men. So there's lots of different reasons why there is a gender gap and why this exists in STEM. And these re reasons are really varied and complex. So it can start from the toys our children are given to play with in childhood to the organisational culture in many workplaces. So there are a myriad of reasons and factors, including um, that, that influence um, women's participation in STEM areas. So how do women break through the glass ceiling? to achieve their goals and what advice do they have for those who want to follow in their footsteps? So to discuss how RMIT is providing women and girls, female students, with the support, skills and knowledge they need to thrive as STEM professionals of the future, of course, and now as well, we've assembled five experts from our RMIT community and I'd really love to welcome them here today. We'll kick off with Kay. Welcome, Kay. And I believe you're the Dean of STEM Diversity and Inclusion here at RMIT. Indeed, thank you, Maddie. And uh, I'm delighted to be here with you this uh, this morning. It's wet Saturday morning. Um, so um, I'm a crystal engineer as well and a professor of chemistry. And more recently, I've taken on this role of Dean STEM Diversity and Inclusion. So I'm passionate about science and also about equality and equity and making sure that everyone gets a fair go. Fantastic. Welcome, Kay. And welcome too to Professor Madhu Baskaran. Welcome today. And, and um, yes, you're also a professor here in RMIT. Yes, I am. Thank you for having me here, Maddie, and thanks to everyone and welcome to everyone as well. So as Maddie said, yes, I'm a professor of electronics engineering here at RMIT University. I actually came to RMIT as a master's student, as an international student back in 2004. So I have been here for a really long time and been integrated to the part of RMIT in many ways. So I lead a group where we actually quite excitedly work from the fundamental technologies to the next generation technologies. So the motto in our group is convert today's science fiction into tomorrow's reality. And that's what we do almost every day in collaboration with industry as well. Fantastic, Madhu. Welcome. And welcome to, to Alison Keeley, Professor Alison Keeley. Great to have you here today. Oh, thanks, Maddie. What an exciting event for RMIT to be hosting. Um, I'm uh, Alison Keeley. I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm now working in geospatial sciences. I'm also a research director of the Smart Satellite Cooperative Research Center. So my areas of interest are really looking at space technologies, and how we apply space technologies to things like driverless cars and drones and exciting technology solutions for the future challenges that society will face. So it's lovely to be here, Maddie. Fantastic, Alison. Looking forward to hearing more about it. And next, uh, Dr. Geeta Pendehaka, welcome today. Thank you, Mary. Lovely to be here this morning and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Geeta Pindharkar. I've, my area of expertise is biomedical engineering, uh, but for the last two years I'm working as a project lead for women in STEM, particularly looking at some of the issues what uh, the females or women have in the vocational side of engineering, which is a quite a broad area and, and really an important area in Australia as well. So thank you, Mary. Great to have you here, Gaita. And last but certainly not least, a big welcome to Kerry Phillips, one of our students here. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's really great. Um, so yeah, I'm Kerry Phillips. I am a dual Australian Canadian citizen, so if my voice sounds strange, that's why. Um, I am a current student, so I'm doing technically three degrees uh, simultaneously. Um, so I obviously have no free time 
So I'm doing a double in aviation and business management, as well as simula, uh, simultaneously doing an associate degree in professional piloting. So getting my pilot's license at Point Cook. Fantastic. We look forward to hearing more about that as well. So just before we get started, I want to reiterate that we will have 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the panel discussion to go through some questions and you can submit your questions in the Q&A tool on the right at any time throughout our discussions. And we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, but if we do run out of time, I imagine we've got lots of questions for our fantastic panel today, then please remember we have live chat and that's currently open and you can join that one at any time as well today. Okay, let's kick off with some questions. Um, firstly, I'd like to touch on role models. So how important do you think it is for young women to have female role models in STEM? Geeta, let's start with your thoughts on this one. Thank you, Mary. Um, <clears throat> it's a really great question. Look, I believe uh, see, um, seeing is believing and hence role models are really important in this society where people are still under the influence of uh, gender stereotypes. For example, when we think of an engineer, what's the immediate picture? What comes to our mind? It's a male figure. We need to have enough female or women figures associated with this word or the image for the society to naturally connect. Uh, to the word or image of engineer. A lot of education is required to break this mindset of the society because of the practices what we, we have been preached for so long and have been polished for years. And hence, as educators and leaders in STEM, it's our job to create enough role models. And that's how important they are in the areas of STEM. Thank you, Mary. Very well said, Geeta. Thank you for sharing your thoughts there. And it's fantastic. We have all these role models here today to hear from. Kerry. In an interview you did not so long ago, something you said really struck me. You said that everyone says their first solo flight is the most memorable one. And you then said my favourite flight was actually my second when I got to do a few laps and I had the realisation that, whoa, I can actually fly a plane and it's something I've been doing and I'm doing it well and it's not something I've fluked. So to me, Kerry, this really speaks of how your confidence has grown through your study. Um, do you think your confidence has grown in other ways? I'd love to hear a bit more about your experience as a woman in a, in a degree program where there are you know, a few more men than, than women there. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so yes, when you do your first solo, you actually do it after roughly 10 to 20 hours of flying experience like ever, which surprises a lot of people. It's very early on you fly a plane yourself. Um, and so you're with your instructor, you do a bunch of like kind of laps or circuits with them. And then all of a sudden they won't tell you, but they'll be like, oh, pull a plane over pretty much. They jump out and then it's your turn <laughs> to do it on your own. And when my instructor did it and he's getting out the plane, I was like, are you sure? And he's like, of course. Like, <laughs> just very fun playing you sausage. And the first one, I was just so happy to have landed and it was just so thankful. Um, so the, for the second one, when you do a lot more circuits, and it was a little bit my, oh, okay, this is, you know, I have a skill, um, which is very much evident in a lot of, especially flight training, um, the confidence factor for women. And it shows that obviously we have such different things to bring to the table. That's why diversity is so important. Um, and so women, they found, learn very differently to men, especially when it comes to flight training. And so they take longer to gain confidence. Um, but what they've actually done is they've done lots of studies, and I've gone really deep into all of this, um, that female pilots at the start take a while to gain confidence, but in the long run end up what they assume and hope to be, there is a small sample size, uh, to be more safe pilots and more confident pilots and have less safety issues. I know I read a study where a male instructor says they kind of sometimes prefer female students because they are more inherently safe. And they say sometimes male students are just as capable, but they do say they get a little bit nervous if they look away for more than half a second, the plane will be upside down because um, they're just a little bit too confident. And so I think it really shows that diversity is so important to have two people of different uh, backgrounds and understandings and learning styles to come together because it really does make it better. And within RMIT, uh, it's it's been so great. They've really adapted to what I need, which happens to be stereotypical, but not always for what women need in learning. Fantastic, Kerry. And, and I believe you're, you're graduating soon, is that right? You're nearly there with your three degrees. 
Yes, yes. Um, I will graduate my double at the end of this semester. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, the flight training has taken a little bit longer, so it might be hopefully the middle of next year. We'll see. Fantastic. Well done, Kerry. Big okay. congratulations from all of us here. <laughs> Um, so a quick reminder, of course, our live Q&A tool is open, so please submit your questions in the chat on the right and our panels will try and our panelists will try and answer those um, at the end of the discussion. All right, so in a recent report by Engineers Australia, which is the peak body for engineering, funnily enough, in Australia, <laughs> uh, this report was on the state of women in engineering and the peak body, they made several recommendations for universities. And this was to help readdress re the gender imbalance in the profession. And one of the recommendations was to promote engineering's human centred opportunities to encourage women's participation. So Madhu, why do you think human centred opportunities um, would be important to young women? And we'd love to hear a little bit about your work in this area too. Thanks, Mary. Um, so yes, I completely agree with you know Geeta's point as well in, in terms of you know the stereotypes of having always showing up engineer as a man, you know, wearing a hard hat in a building site. Uh, there's much more to engineering than civil engineering. I mean, engineering has numerous branches, right from aerospace and biomedical engineering, electronics engineering, electrical engineering, and the other end of the spectrum is manufacturing and mechanical engineering as well. So in all scales, you know, you're talking really nano scales all the way to macro scales. And Humanitarian engineering is kind of, you know, engineering with a purpose. And I think engineers are always known to be problem solvers. So there are many problems in the world, which the world just keeps giving us to solve. And coming up with innovative solutions for them all the time is what engineers do. And I think when you translate that into a purpose, that seems to agree or seems to, you know, appeal more to the, uh, to the women in their genders. And they found that overseas a lot more women who choose to do certain branches of engineering where the purpose of engineering is very, very clear. And I think that's something which is which we're trying to do within RMIT as well. So we do have some humanitarian engineering projects where you appeal more in terms of the community aspects of the engineering and where your particular innovations can actually make their way to society to solving problems. So to answer your second question, so as I indicated earlier, I'm an electronics engineer and one of the fascinating things which we develop in our group are wearable sensors. So sensors which are really as thin as, you know, a bandaid, which you can wear on your skin or wear on clothes. And they do fantastic things. They're very, very versatile patches. So they kind of look like this. So they're really thin, they're transparent, pretty much like contact lens type materials. And you can't really see it. And that's the entire idea behind it, that you don't really want to feel yourself wearing this. So what these can do for you is we can make them do a lot of different things so right from monitoring the UV around us to you know warn us about our UV exposure and therefore the incidence of skin trying to drop the incidence of skin cancer for instance that's one of the applications but one of the most excited ones which I'm really happy we're working with is in the aged care sector and that is really really topical at the moment as well so we work with companies where we're trying to put these sensors within mattresses and trying to provide non-invasive monitoring of the residents in an aged care facility. Now that could be just their presence or the absence in the bed, but also their physiological parameters as in the sense, is their heart rate you know, normal? Is their breathing rate normal? And when do you need medical intervention? So having introducing technology into areas which where technology has never really gone before, those are some of the exciting things which we're working on in our lab. Fantastic. And and so Madhu, where are you up to in the process from, you know, blue sky research to application to then wide scale distribution and use of these devices and, and sensors? So when we started this work, it was nearly eight years back and just started off with a simple premise of, you know, our devices are really, they're much more functional. You've, you've really shrunk down devices and miniaturized them, but then, you know, they still break. They're very breakable. Almost everyone might have the, you know, the uh, unfortunate experience of dropping a mobile phone and watching the screen crack and things don't quite behave the same way once you've, you know, you've broken them or they've fallen down or they had some kind of mechanical impact. So that was the idea when we started eight years back trying to develop unbreakable electronics. We patented our work in around three or four years back and started working quite actively with industry in the last two years. And with some of our products and technology, we should be hitting the market in say two to three years time or sometimes even sooner if it doesn't have too many medical implications and you know, uh, accreditations and affiliations, things like that. 
Well, a big congratulations for, from us and it's just fantastic to hear more about that work today. Yes, and of course the human centred aspects of that engineering and across all engineering actually, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, benefits for our world and our people. Excellent. So there is substantial evidence out there uh, that teams with diverse thinkers are better at solving problems than non-diverse teams. So Kay, as Victoria's first Dean of STEM diversity and inclusion, how do you think diversity enhances and contributes to problem solving? Well, thank you, um, Maddie. That's uh, an excellent question. And uh, indeed, Kerry did actually touch on the impact of diversity and, and its power in, in uh, achievement. Um, well, people are a product of their environment and their experiences. We have our own ways of doing things and we develop patterns of thinking and approaching that help us understand uh, the world around us and how we progress within it. And that serves us well generally, but occasionally we'll come across something that really stumps us or we're invited to crack a really big problem like Maddie's doing indeed. Um, I mean, it could be as simple, let's say, as what's the answer to four down in the crossword? And it leaves you scratching your head for hours and then someone will lean over your shoulder, see the clue and the number of letters for the first time and have the answer straight away. It's both annoying and very satisfying at the same time because the job's actually got done. Um, so what's happened here is that uh, our knowledge bank recall or approach has either failed us or is not very efficient in that instance. And, and someone else comes along with new knowledge looks at the problem from a different perspective and the answer has emerged and that shows the importance of bringing another voice to the table and, and without it we might just keep looking at the problem in the same way uh, and be frustrated by it. So the greater the diversity of, of thinkers around the table the more quickly we're likely to arrive at a solution and often the more creative and innovative that solution might be and it's particularly powerful for solving complex problems, as I've said. Fantastic. And and so I Kay, think an, an example from from my own way of working. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that would be great. No, and, and, uh, I'm working in crystal engineering and, and whilst I bring the chemical and structural expertise, if I'm designing a material for a particular application, I, I might need to, the inputs of biologists and physicists or comp computational models or engineers. Um, it would all, we'd all have to come together to design something that was fit for purpose. Yeah, no, so true, Kay. I found the same in my research, you know. I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm okay with maths and stats, but I know someone who's excellent at it and together we work as a team to answer, you know, problems and questions about the natural world. So it really st it goes across all STEM disciplines, I would, would say, would others agree? that. Yeah, drawing on that teamwork and others' um, knowledge and expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so Kay, could you tell us a bit more about what RMI do, RMIT is doing to encourage greater diversity, particularly um, for women in STEM? Okay, um, well RMIT has always been about inclusion and we've been proudly supporting and encouraging a diverse range of students for well over 100 years. But as you said, the participation of women in STEM is still remains quite a hard nut to, to crack. But what we've been doing recently is we've been um, working very hard to ensure that our talented female staff and students in STEM are visible. Um, in today's showcase on our website, marketing materials and in the range of expert opinions, that you might hear in the media, you'll see a greater diversity of, of gender um, and culture uh, in, in our media representation. And as you've already heard from, from yourself and from Gita, um, the presence of role models is exceedingly important um, in STEM and for women. You can't be what you can't see. Um, the most recent campaign that we, we had uh, around our, our website resulted in a tenfold increase in the number of hits to that website. Uh, and we now have about 400 STEM qualified women who have expressed interest to become um, an academic uh, member of staff at RMIT. Um, apart from this, we've um, 
overhauled our recruitment methods to ensure that we have 50-50 male-female shortlisting and 50-50 panel representation. And we've introduced more flexibility into our working patterns and into our study options. Um, we've got an extensive programme um, for mentoring of staff and students. Um, we are starting to make progress and indicators would include um, our new flexible first year that we have in engineering. We have a far greater diversity of students in that first year than we've ever seen in our engineer across our engineering programs. And that's a fabulous uh, achievement and we'll go towards that pipeline. Uh, we now have 44 percent of our leaders are women and that's gone up by nearly 10 percent in the last five years or so. And we've got we've received various benchmarks from important diversity and inclusion bodies um, like we've been employer of choice for gender equity for the last three years, employer of the year for LGBTIQ plus inclusion for 2019 and, and 20. And we're rated the number one Australian organisation for accessibility and inclusion by the Australian Network on Disability. And these are just some of the indicators. And it's not just me and my team, and we have um, Maddie and Gita and everyone here has fed into uh, the work, but it's across our people, our student engagement and our leadership who have been absolutely vital in the progression of RMIT. Yes, so well said, Kay. Really embedded at all levels, including leadership. Fantastic. Um, so Alison, Hi there, <laughs> we haven't heard from you just yet. How about a question for you? So Alison, you've had extensive experience in both industry and academia. So have you seen a shift towards supporting and empowering women in STEM? And what work is there still to do? Oh, that's a, that, that's a hard question, Maddie. Um, you know, uh, have I seen it yet? You know, it's, the, the, the culture we've been exposed to, you know, the, the, the view of the world we've been exposed to for a long time has been one that has been uh, gendered in some ways. And so in in that way, we've we've all and our young people, you know, I'm trying to answer that question. I've got a 12 year old daughter and a 14 year old son who are trying to to present a worldview to them as well um, that is 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 somehow more balanced, but we, we have to accept that for a while our view of the world hasn't been balanced. And so I guess um, the experiences I have had have been along the lines of that imbalance has dominated decision making processes. They've impacted on the progression of women in, in certain career areas. It's certainly been one that that for both men and women, I don't think they've seen a very balanced view. And so I think the work that Kay is talking about at RMIT, which is very, very important to changing that view um, so that when when we, we present ourselves to young people who are looking at the choices available to them, what we are presenting them with is a, a much more balanced view. So when, when you ask me what, what's left to be done, um, I don't envy Kay's task in kind of um, uh, generating that change, but I think things are changing. You know, I look at my own children and not just for my daughter, but for my son as well. Their views of the world are changing. And so I think what's left to do is to do things like this, you know, presenting um, women who are trying to to change the perception of what we are able to achieve and accomplish um, uh, under you know historically uh, difficult circumstances and really i think the most important thing that's left to do would be to to take that change and change culture um, if we are able to to channel all that change into a, a change culture for the workplace then i think we we've kind of done uh, future generations are real good um, because they'll see the role models, they'll see the opportunities and they'll enter a culture that is very much supportive and, and values their contributions at all levels. So well said, Alison. Thank you. Thank